We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Jessica Henry, and I'm excited to be introducing John and Kitty today. Dr. John Perlick arrived here at Hastings College in 1999, and Kitty came four years later in 2003. Uh, Kitty's actually, actually an alum of Hastings College, so she was here many years before that as well. Both John and Kitty are active on campus. In addition to teaching their classes, Kitty is the advisor for SAI, the Women's Music Honorary, and for 5.0 as well. And John is the advisor for Lambda Pi Eta. That's the Communication Studies Honorary. And Lambda Pi Eta this year just won a big award. They were the chapter of the year nationally. And John won the award as the National uh, Advisor of the Year. And he's going to get the award, and the chapter will get the award at the National Communication Convention in November, so that's a big honor for them. Uh, I could um, spend more time telling you about their academic record, but I wanted to, since they're discussing the fear of public speaking, sort of transition a little bit more into talking about them and the speech team. Both John and Kitty coach the speech team, and they've been doing it for a number of years, and it's a nationally competitive speech team, and if you don't understand how it works, it's a little different than sports. There are no divisions for the speech team like there are in sports, so they compete with every college that's out there that has a speech team, and they compete on an evil, even level. And uh, the team that we have is nationally competitive and has been uh, for a number of years. And uh, they do a great job coaching the speech team. Most often, they're in the top 20 schools in the nation, which is a big accomplishment for a small college like Hastings College. I wanted to, uh, I asked some students to give me some feedback because I thought it would be best to give you some quotations from some students of theirs. And one student said, if it weren't for these two faculty members, I don't think I would be pursuing an education past graduation from Hastings College. They have both inspired me with their integrity for the liberal arts. I've learned just as much from them outside of the classroom as I have from them in the classes. So I think that's a, a testament to their willingness to help students even outside of class. And another student wrote, both John and Kitty have been invaluable in my personal growth as a student and a speech and debate competitor. And in the process, they have given me a priceless gift, my voice. And uh, so I think that that shows they've made a big contribution to a lot of students. Uh, they told me to make this intro short, but I did want to, to make it a little bit more fun, give you a little bit of information on a personal level about them. Um, both John and Kitty have two young daughters, and Kitty said that one of her interests outside of teaching in the college is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, geocaching, is that right? Where you know, where you look for little hidden treasures, um, and so I thought that was sort of a fun little tidbit of information about Kitty. Uh, John, every year, and I'm telling you this because it's October and almost Halloween, uh, one of the fun traditions that he has with his daughters is he uh, goes on a giant pumpkin hunt for a great pumpkin. You know those big, huge Atlantic giants that cost like $40? And uh, so that's sort of a fun little uh, bit about him. So um, I would like to welcome them, and uh, as you can see, we're here to talk about the fear of public speaking today, and hopefully they will uh, help you overcome some of the fears that you may or may not have. So please welcome uh, Dr. John Perlick and Dr. Kitty Grace. Can you hit that slide? Good afternoon. Um, Welcome to the 10 o'clock meeting, October 29th, 2012, um, session of Phobics Unanimous, hit blank screen. Don't you love technology? Welcome to uh, the 10 a.m., October 29th, 2012 meeting of Phobics Unanimous. Uh, my name is John, and I stand before you a phobic of technology. <laughs> there it is. It's a, it's a bigger audience than we are used to. It perhaps is because of the holiday season. Um, with Halloween two days away, we see that there are a lot of folks that are here to share with us. Um, is there anyone who'd like to begin today by coming out and sharing their story of a personal phobia, something uh, you're dealing uh, with? I, I think I'm ready to share my, my fear with you all. Um, Hi. I have a phobia. It's called skurophobia. That's the phobia of squirrels. 
While you see fuzzy little creatures running around out there, this is what I view on a daily basis. <laughs> you see, when I was six years old, I went to Florida with my family. We were at the Everglades, and there are signs all over that say, do not feed the squirrels. So my father takes a piece of my chocolate chip ice cream cone and feeds it to the squirrel. The squirrel realizes that it's not a very high hike up to the rest of that ice cream cone. I was six years old, pretty dang short. Not that much has changed. And the squirrel looked where it was at and shimmied up my leg for the rest of the ice cream cone. I kicked and screamed and screamed and screamed, but I kept my ice cream cone. Yes. But it didn't stop there because after that event, every time we were walking through the rest of the park and the days that followed, my dad would sing the theme song to Jaws every time we would see a squirrel. Na 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 na. Really reinforcing my state-based fear of those critters right up there. So, what do we fear more than death or squirrels? Communication apprehension. So today we want to give you a better appreciation for your fears and help you to embrace those fears. We'll do so by first looking at the causes, which include trait-based fears and state-based fears, looking at those effects, and finally taking a look at some action steps you can take in order to embrace your fears. So I'll turn it over to John and he can tell you a little bit more about those trait-based fears. We're meeting here today for uh, Phobics Unanimous because we know that everyone has some sort of fear, but the one that tends to be over and over again through the research cropping up as number one in the United States. Now, sometimes this fear is bumped for snakes. Sometimes this is bumped for spiders. Number one in the United States, or in the top three most of the time, will end up being communication apprehension or glossophobia. In fact, it's the work of James McCroskey in communication apprehension that has found that 95% of Americans suffer from glossophobia or measurable speech anxiety. Now, for some of us, it's more pronounced than for others. And that's the first thing for us to talk about today is what exactly is the nature of the fear that we face. In Kitty's situation, her fear of squirrels wouldn't constitute what I'm first talking about. Her fear of squirrels is best known as state apprehension. In other words, she's afraid of something very specific, very particular. In my case, my fear might be a little bit more like trait apprehension, but it's not entirely trait apprehension. My fear tends to cut across a wide variety of contexts and a wide variety of areas. My fear is known as pythanophobia. What do you suppose that's a fear of? Sounds like the fear of snakes, doesn't it? It's not. Given that I'm an intellect, my fear is actually the fear of probability. <laughs> probability, pythanophobia. It means that when I travel, if I'm in a van or I'm on an airline flight, I'm actually calculating how many safe flights, because I'm pretty well traveled. I've had a chance to go to 48 of the 50 United States. Every time I'm on the road or on a, a plane, I start thinking to myself, wow, this is journey number what? And how many times have I made it safely to my destination? Hmm. At some point, it seems like given statistics, I might be due <laughs> for an encounter that's not going to go quite as well. Now, there's nothing logical about this whatsoever. But my fear pythanophobia means that I'm kind of afraid of the probability that something might happen to me at any given point. Now, much like pythanophobia cutting across several contexts, trade apprehension means that you live in a fairly stable dispositional state. In other words, you're constantly anxious. You have pronounced fear that cuts across the board. What we know, and, and this is when Kitty and I are dealing with people who have glossophobia, that sort of state apprehension, we have more uphill battle to deal with those individuals when they also have trade apprehension. In other words, it's a character of their disposition. We know again from McCroskey that trait apprehension amplifies glossophobia. And when I say an amplifier, it means that all of us might, 95% of us, have some fear about giving a presentation. Those who live with trait apprehension have it amplified as a result of their natural disposition. 
Those of you with trade apprehension might have walked in today and looked around and felt a little bit of nervousness. What kind of cues were in the environment around you <laughs> when you walked in this morning that might have caused you to be slightly apprehensive as you came in this chapel today? What did you see? Hmm? Professors taking role. Professors taking role. Makes us nervous. Any other cues? Hmm? It's dark. It's dark. Mm -hmm. Who noticed, admit it, who noticed the warning tape? What went through your mind when you saw that? Asbestos. Asbestos. <laughs> Great answer. You see the orange tape over there, you might think the balcony. It's about to collapse. If you didn't notice or didn't care, chances are you're not suffering from trade apprehension. But for those of us who saw it and our, our attention was piqued, it might suggest that maybe you're living in that sort of state of anxiety. Clearly it's Halloween decorations, but it caused you to be concerned. We also know with trade apprehension, and this is an interesting finding from Papenga, those who have trade apprehension tend to lose it, it subsides with time, particularly non-traditional students, those students who are in that 25 plus age range. Is this going to suggest to us that with time, we sort of adopt an attitude that this too shall pass? I know, and Kitty and I are both gonna have a chance to talk about our kids a little bit today. When my children come home from the playground or from school, if they've had a, a tough moment, no matter how hard as a dad I say, hey, it happens, it's okay, don't worry about it, life's gonna go on. I'm not living their experience. I don't know what they're going through. And it seems like the younger that we are, the harder it is for us to get past those moments. And yet I know, for me, if something weird or embarrassing happens, like technology fails us, I'm not gonna freak out because that stuff has happened to me before. I know that it'll all probably be okay. No need to freak out, no need to really worry. Is it that with age, we start to adopt this sort of attitude, this too shall pass? If that's the case, it might explain why students who are in the non category suffer from less trade apprehension. We also know from Rimbaugh and from Jones and colleagues that not only is trade apprehension harder to reduce. Kitty and I at the end of our presentation today will share with you some things that we can do to deal with communication apprehension. Those who suffer from trade apprehension and amplify that fear suffer more so, and it's harder for them to get past it. Lastly, they tend not to seek out help. Why would it be that people with trade apprehension won't seek out the opportunities that are given to them in a communication situation? What's the reason? Why would it be that people would not seek out the opportunity, the help that's been afforded to them? Thoughts? Brianna, help me out. Hmm? One more time. Okay. So they're, they're putting themselves in a spot where they have to do it. They have to face it. Why else would people not take advantage of the opportunities that are afforded them? Trade apprehension means that it's dispositional. It's part of our character. So why wouldn't we step up? It, it could be embarrassing. It's not in our character. If it's part of your character, it's a dispositional. If it's ingrained within you, you might feel frankly like it's hopeless. There's no way that I can ever get past this. And, and if that is indeed the case, it would make sense what Jones has found, that people don't tend to step up and take those opportunities that are afforded to them, which we'll talk about later on today. We also know that communication anxiety, glossophobia, is often piqued by a number of things. And so some studies in this area. First of all, like other fears, who, by the way, admits to having a fear of injection or needles or blood? A few of us? Okay. The, 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 the initials that you see up here, BII, that's a particular type of fear, blood, injection, and injury fears. Um, I've been lucky enough at this point in my life to never once been hospitalized. 
Um, throughout my life, I've had a number of bumps and bruises and scrapes and cuts. Uh, you know, all of us have had those kind of like minor injuries. How many of you are like me and you've never once been hospitalized? Okay, it'll be interesting to see if your experience <laughs> is like mine. Um, what we find in terms of Smith and Murat, um, those people who have BII fears, um, when surveyed and, and, and their background is, is analyzed, we find that they had a particularly intense bad experience in their past, which then almost becomes, and I like to look at this slide as being from the fuse. In other words, could our fear, our trait fear be ignited by something that happened quickly, um, almost like a flashpoint. And from that point on, it just becomes deeply inset. Or is it hereditary, an inheritance, something that's given to us? In the case of BII fears, we find that those people with that fear, there's a flashpoint, something that ignites it. Could that be the case with trade apprehension as well, that a particular moment, one part of our life that something happened and bam, from that point on, like a fuse, that bomb explodes and there it is, trade apprehension, it continues with us. We also know that anticipation, and this is a weird one, this is really interesting. Um, if you look to Volder's work in, in anticipation, they, they primed people and talked with individuals about safety precautions in a setting. Now you would think that like if you're on an airplane and someone comes out and gives you directions for how to get off the plane if there's some sort of emergency, you think that these kind of precautions put, it, put us at ease, right? They're like a safety belt that we're gonna be wearing. No, Volders found that when you talked about safety precautions with people who have measurable trade apprehension, it piqued their fear. It caused more anxiety, why? They're not thinking about the ways in which they're gonna be saved from a situation. They're thinking, oh, uh, there's safety precautions? You mean something can go wrong here? Um, I don't wanna be here anymore. And so it just takes off. The anticipation that something could go wrong is what causes them to have even more trait-based fear. We also know affect. I like to call this study, by the way, Buetti and the Beast, because they studied spiders. And they asked people, and they surveyed people about their mood coming into this study. And what they found is that people who were in a great mood, people who had a positive attitude coming into the study, tended to have less reaction to an aversive stimuli, in particular the spider that was shown to them, than those individuals who came into the study in a sour, dour, negative, sad mood. Um, again, emotion seems to sort of correlate along with trait. The last one, however, that the, the, the fact is that trait-based apprehension might be something that's a bit of an inheritance, uh, a gift, if we want to call it that, that our family has given us. Um, I first started reading about trade apprehension in this case when I was reading the work of Joseph Campbell, who then talks about the work of Conrad Lawrence, and there's an interesting story in his works that talks about chicks on a farm. Now, being a city boy, someone who was raised in Minneapolis, I didn't have a lot of experience with chicks, but apparently, right after they're hatched, and they run around all over the place, they're not afraid of the average shadow of most birds. Robins fly over, cardinals fly over, um, bluebirds fly over. They're not going to be uh, afraid at all of those shadows that are passing by. And yet, if they're, they're exposed to the shadow of the chicken hawk, whether it's a real chicken hawk or a cardboard facsimile, the chicks will scurry. Now, they haven't been attacked by a chicken hawk yet. There's been nothing that's hit them or attacked them to prompt that fear, but they're almost ingrained to react to that sign stimuli. You know, are there certain stimuli in our environment that cause us to feel more scared than we already feel if it's dispositional? Um, think about some of the sign stimuli that might fall in that category for us. If you see a skeleton, and, and might this be something that allowed our species to survive and thrive? You see a skeleton on the ground, a skull laying there, do you have a from-the-gut reaction to that? In other words, is that skeleton telling you, run away because someone has died in this place before? Very possibly that image is that type of sign stimuli, like the chicken hawk image for those chicks. My daughter yesterday, when we came to Trick or Treat Street, right out here outside the chapel, she was doing great with all the different activities and games as long as there weren't a lot of people around, but she got to one particular game or challenge, there were a lot of people gathered around that challenge and she suddenly got shy. And it was the same challenge, it was a beanbag toss. I found myself thinking, do crowds sort of serve as that type of stimuli for us? In other words, a sign stimuli. Are some of us in many ways ingrained or imprinted to be afraid of crowds? Because there's a danger in that throng of people looking at us and coming towards us. Now everything that I've talked about with regard to trade apprehension 
it's neither exhaustive nor exclusive. And you're going to see, even as I talked about it, some of it muddies over to state anxiety. At this point, what Kitty will do is deal more uh, accurately with glossophobia or speech anxiety stage fright and talk about state-based fear. Our state-based apprehension is apprehension that occurs within a given environment or a given situation. As Woods calls it, 2012, she says that most of our fear is learned. And so most of us with the 95% fear deal with more of the state-based apprehension. We have a tendency to see this in some ways through the media and how it influences us. Gerbner 1990 identifies this as cultivation theory, where you have the mean world syndrome. You watch a lot of violent television, you're going to lock your doors and think that you're in a violent situation. And so that can help influence our state-based fears. And that media influence has definitely, unfortunately, influenced my life with my little one, Lissa. You see, when she was two, she loved to sleep in a cave-like situation. We had blankets up over the windows. We even rolled a towel underneath the door to keep it as dark as possible. Well, she goes to daycare and starts to be influenced by her peers, as well as Monsters, Inc. movie, and realizes, oh, I shouldn't like the dark, I should be afraid of the dark. And therefore, we had to take the blankets off her door, take the towel off of uh, underneath the door, and every once in a while, she asks me even to lay with her for a few minutes because I'm just so scared of the dark, Mom. So that cultivation theory definitely has come to fruition within my life. Uh, Wood says that there are five different uh, state-based fears that, uh, or, or that help to cause us to become more fearful. The first is unfamiliar people. You see the Democrat-Republican uh, icon up there. Uh, Glinton in 2012 did a study about you all, younger voters, those under 30, and found that because you don't relate or don't understand who the candidates are, Romney and Obama, they seem as unfamiliar people, most of you aren't going to go to the polls as a result. So there's a fewer percentage uh, than four years ago of young folks that are going to go to the polls. So please, prove Glinton wrong and go to the polls and vote. Don't let that unfamiliar attitude influence you as far as individuals are concerned. Uh, Unusual situations are another cause of our state-based fear. I have a personal um, story with this. That's why there's the embarrassed kitty up there. Get it? Embarrassed kitty. <laughs> uh, when I was a student here at Hastings College as a senior, I was on the speech team, and we went to Illinois for a tournament. And this judge was really, really cute. His name was Joel Chamara. And I was just praying that I didn't have him in a round, right? The situation. It happened. So there he is sitting there as my judge, and I'm ready to give my informative speech, and I'm all embarrassed because he's really cute. And then it's on sperm washing, so that's a little uncomfortable too. And then to make matters even worse, I had my visual aids upside down. So it definitely created a apprehension for me given that particular state. So uh, unusual situations can definitely cause a little bit of apprehension. Uh, being in the spotlight, that can cause apprehension too. You see movies all the time about brides, blushing brides who get cold feet going down the aisle. Or another Lissa story, that's my daughter. This uh, summer, she was in a melodrama, but once she got up on the stage, no way Jose would she perform. She runs around circles playing Superman at our church and it has no issue, but get her up on stage or performing for the 4th of July parade around Fisher Fountain and she did not want to move those wheels. That's definitely a situation where all eyes are on you and that can create your heart to race a little bit and uh-uh, do not want to be a part of this. Uh, the fourth one is the fear of being evaluated. This example here is the notion of being judged. We've all experienced that at some point in time, whether you're having an evaluation or you're giving a speech for a class and you're being rated, that, that fear can definitely creep up. Uh, Phil Davidson, unfortunately, has a really bad uh, effect as far as this is concerned. And some of you have seen this. We'll show just a, a minute of this clip. But he was being evaluated because he was running for the Stark County Treasurer's Office. He wanted the position uh, to gain on the ballot as the GOP candidate. So he was being evaluated. 
people would go to the polls and vote for him or not based on his presentation. Uh, so here we have a little bit of Phil and you can see his anxiety. Ladies and gentlemen of the Star County Republican Party Executive Committee, good evening. And thank you not only for your attendance, but for allowing me the opportunity to speak. My name is Phil Davison, and I am seeking our party's nomination for the position of Star County Treasurer on November 10th, November of 2010, excuse me. In terms of my background, I am from the village of Minerva, where I am serving my 13th year as the of elected service as a Minerva Council member. In terms of elections across Star County, I have represented our party twice on the county ballot in both the primary and the general elections when I ran for Star County Clerk of Courts in 1996 and Star County Commissioner in 2000. And I will not apologize for my tone tonight. I have been a Republican in times good, and I have been a Republican in times bad. So if you'd like to see the rest of that five and a half minute segment, uh, please feel free to YouTube Phil Davidson and you can get a nice little chortle. The the deal is, though, when you talk to Phil or see other interviews with him outside of this setting, he's very commonplace, very normal, ha has a very uh, subdued disposition. But when you're in an evaluative situation, the heart starts racing and apparently the volume must increase exponentially. So that's the notion of being evaluated. The last is our past failures. They have a tendency to influence our future experiences with situations. And I have a picture of a car up here because I have a kind of sad story. My aunt uh, doesn't drive. And when she was 18, she drove into the ditch and grandma looked at her and said, see, this is why women shouldn't be behind the wheel. Yes, very independent woman, very successful, but has to take public transportation in Vegas because of that past failure, it still continued to haunt her and she's over 50 years old now. So these are the causes, trait-based and state-based, but how does this influence us? How does this affect us, both positively and negatively? And I'll turn it over to John to talk about the positive aspects. I'm probably gonna get in a lot of trouble for sharing this story, but I'm still gonna do it. The other day, my daughter and I were watching television at home, uh, surfing through the channels, and I happened to come across a classic show that I loved when I was younger, and a lot of us will um, try to intentionally find this program, given the time of year that it is. Uh, stumbled across the show, Arachnophobia. I'm getting in trouble already. <laughs> my daughter, Caden, is very, very afraid of spiders. In fact, um, the first real manifestation of her fear of spiders happened when we were coming back from Prairie Loft. We had a little garden out there, and we're coming back one day, and a spider must have gotten in the car because of all the trees that are out there, uh, and was up on the top of the car inside, and it dropped down on its web and landed on her. She proceeded to scream as I'm driving on second, trying to get home, scream, unbuckle and attempt to jump into the front seat with me. <laughs> At which point I have to pull over to the side and deal with this very, very, very tiny spider. Nonetheless, is that one of those incendiary moments that, like a flashpoint, it hits us and it causes these kind of problems for us? Well, as we're surfing and we come across arachnophobia, I say to her, oh, sweetie, this is about the fear of spiders. We can't watch this. She's like, no, oh, I want to. I want to. Okay, against my better judgment, we continue to watch. And if you haven't seen the film, the main character, the actor that's in there, Jeff Daniels, a fantastic actor. Some of you might remember him from Dumb and Dumber, um, opposite of Jim Carrey. Jeff Daniels is very afraid of spiders, and his wife is trying to help him get past this fear of spiders. So they go out to the barn where there is this very lethal, we don't know yet in the film, but this very lethal spider that's built this beautiful Charlotte's web up in the rafters. And Jeff Daniels climbs up the ladder at his wife's urging to go see the spider because she's trying to convince him they're beautiful. You know, don't be afraid of them. 
And he gets to the top of the ladder. He's one rung away from the very top, and he sees this beautiful web, and he, he's starting to appreciate the beauty of spiders for the first time in his life. And as he reaches for that top rung, he grabs it, it breaks. The ladder itself breaks, knocks down a skeleton of a rat, which falls onto his face, and his wife is just staring at him. He's freaking out at this point. My daughter, as we're watching this, can't help what happens next. This high-pitched squeal that I think only I and dogs could hear <laughs> comes erupting from her mouth. And at the same time that that squeal comes erupting out of her, she then looks to me and starts giggling with delight. She's both amused and terrified at the exact same time. You know, we know this is true, that fear is often fun. Um, so as we talk about some of the advantages of fear, most of these we understand because we'll do things on purpose that scare us because they're delightful and they're fun and they're enjoyable. We'll go do them because of that. First of all, these advantages come from wood, 2012. The first one is increased energy. That when we are encountering stimuli that make us fearful, our body reacts. It's going to produce uh, adrenaline, blood sugar, and as a result, we have increased energy as a result of that stimuli. Now, the next effect then that, that segues from that is with that energy, often in terms of glossophobia or giving a presentation, we're more, we're more um, animated and energetic and energized when in that situation because of the adrenaline, because of the blood sugar. Um, and so, yeah, there are a lot of benefits, and these two seem to suggest that don't run away from not only a speaking opportunity, but, but be ready to embrace that stage fright and that speech anxiety because of the benefits it has for you as a speaker. We also know that anxiety and fear will make us prepare. Um, it is the fear of looking badly to our peers and our friends and our colleagues that causes us to put in a lot of extra time on an effort, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, in fact, it's the ec extra effort that you put in in preparation that's going to often help you avoid looking bad. So there, th that's a benefit. We have to embrace that. Lastly, we know from a book by an uh, author named Gavin De Becker. this one came out with a very curious title in 1997 called The Gift of Fear. Um, and a lot of folks didn't like, realize, well, what well, fear, that's something that's bad. It's a lot of times in my communication classes, I'll talk about conflict. And I'll ask my students, give me synonyms for conflict. And as we brainstorm over theirs, what do we come up with? War, battle, disagreement. What are some other ones? Fight. Think of how all of those other words for conflict have that negative connotation. Is the same with fear. You know, related to fear is excitement, but they're certainly not the same construct, right? Fear has that negative construct for us. We automatically have this sort of aversion to that word. Um, De Becker argued in the book that embracing your fear, it's a little bit like the theory that you listen to your body and when your body tells you to eat and you kind of have a, a craving for a particular type of food, maybe your body is telling you for a reason that you need something. There's a, a, a nutrient in there that you should probably have. Listening to our body with regard to fear can be a good idea because it keeps us away from danger. Um, in terms of glossophobia, maybe you shouldn't be presenting on an issue if you don't, if you are nervous about it, perhaps you don't have the background that you need to talk on that subject and your body's fear is telling you, you shouldn't be speaking on that yet because you need more information. There's absolutely nothing wrong with listening to that fear and making a very informed decision based on it. Now, the advantages of fear we tend to know what we probably need to discuss more today would be, with glossophobia, the negative effects or disadvantages of fear. The disadvantages can be definitely debilitating. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that we have a tendency to silence ourselves or we censor ourselves and we conform to others. Noel Newman in 1974 calls this a spiral of silence. We're in a group of people and we have an alternate opinion than them and we don't speak out because all of these other individuals are giving alternate opinions and they're suggesting that that's the majority and that's what we gotta go with. And so it creates this spiral. So we continue to stay quiet and continue to stay quiet and then feel muted and feel that we don't have a voice as a result. You can probably think of situations that you've been in. Maybe you go home after you've had your education here and you've changed your viewpoint politically and at the dinner table they're all talking about a particular politician that they're going to vote for, but you don't feel the same way. 
Uh, if you're strong enough in your family, you might be able to make that fight happen, but mm, maybe you decide to stay silent about it, and so your family just feels that you're a part of, of them. So as far as your opinions are concerned. So that notion of self-censorship self can definitely be an issue uh, as far as the disadvantages if we have too much fear to speak. Uh, the other disadvantages are missed opportunities. Uh, Winona, Winona Judd, Brain State Technologies 2012, had an opportunity to sing with Frank Sinatra when she was just a little girl and she was afraid. She didn't think her voice was good enough. She didn't think she had enough skills to be able to talk and sing with Frank Sinatra, and so she let that opportunity pass. So now every interview that she has, that's the one thing that they say, you know, what is one of your disadvantages, or what would you change? And she would have sang with Frank Sinatra, which would have spiraled her into stardom even sooner. So we have to watch out for those missed opportunities that happen. Additionally, we need to recognize that a disadvantage of this fear could be harming relation, relationships and having less civic engagement. Uh, I think the example of hoarders is a pretty good one for both of those situations. Anybody watch hoarders? A few? Yeah, a newer TLC show that shows individuals who have pretty much sequestered themselves into their homes uh, and they keep buying stuff to try to fill a void, whether it's because they lost a job or lost a loved one, and they don't feel that they're able to get out there and talk with other people. So the camera comes in and you get a chance to be able to see all of the tensions that these individuals go through and the drama based on fears that they have manifested into themselves and try to help them overcome those fears. So we do need to figure out ways to overcome and to appreciate our fears. And we wanna have an opportunity here to let you all think about this. Um, side over here, you're gonna be case one. I want you to talk with each other briefly about the communication anxiety having a negative impact on your lives. What kind of negative impacts does fear have for you? And over here, you're gonna take the case two, how anxiety has a positive impact on your lives. So take just one minute, talk with your neighbor, and talk about those particular anxieties. So do you want to ask quickly one of them, or do you want to just say, do you want to ask them, or do you want to just go to the yeah. As you're, um, as you're talking about this, uh, the reason we wanted to take a second for you to think about it, we're guessing that whether or not communication anxiety is a positive or a negative in your life, what we should do with this information, the answers ultimately become the same. If we're talking about it on this side of the aisle and it has this negative force in our lives, we shouldn't be running from it. We shouldn't be letting the disadvantages take sway. Instead, we should be stepping up to try and do what we can to fight. And those of us who on this side are saying, well, it has all of these advantages, all of these positives, these are the things that we should be doing if we are you know, getting the harvest from communication anxiety. Let's join groups, let's get in front of people, let's make a difference, let's try making change by talking and using our voices. The answers, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, ultimately are very similar. And so as we're talking about that issue, what do we do? What do we do? What we've given you so far is just knowledge about trait and state anxiety, um, the effects that it would have on us, and obviously knowledge can start to make change in our lives. It's the starting point. But we wanted to give some very pragmatic and, and behavioral changes that people can make in order to start dealing with this, especially if you're on the side of the aisle where it's disadvantageous to your life. The first one to talk about as far as making change would be cognitive restructuring. Change your brain. This simply means thinking about a speech experience differently. Why is it that uh, any kind of event in our life that's really fun but threatening physically is still delightful and we'll laugh about it? People will jump out of a plane with a thin veil of cloth over them. I know people who have done this. And, and they'll plummet towards the ground. The chance of death is there. Um, you'll bungee cord with a rubber band around your ankles and jump from a platform and bounce over a river. 
Um, we will go flying at 50 miles an hour down a snowy covered mountain heading in down the, that hill towards the bottom and we're laughing and we're excited and the adrenaline has our heart pumping. All of these we seek out. They're adventures. And yet they all have a physical risk to them. Where is the physical risk of giving a presentation? I'm not going to plummet to my death. I'm not going to smack my head on a rock. That's not going to happen. Is it possible for us to take the same label we put on these physically threatening events and put it on giving a speech, communicating, instead of seeing it as something to be avoided and feared, to see it as something that's an opportunity to be relished and embraced? That seems like quite a possibility. Now, there are some problems here, admittedly, as we look to research in this area. We know that a lot of our fears, as I've already pointed out, are in the long-term memory. They're deeply seated. They've been there for a long, long time. The problem with dealing with fear and changing our brain is often fear extinction therapies are dealing with the short-term memory. Okay? We're dealing with what's right there in front of us in the right now. Something has to happen to kind of make that connection between these two. And there's a study coming out next year, nearby Rabinick and colleagues, 2013, that suggests that there is a chemical in a fairly well-known plant, THC, that might be able to help us bridge the gap between these two, these two parts of the brain. As Kitty's been reading up on this, she's found something. Yes, that uh, ecstasy also helps with this uh, restructuring of your brain because it can actually remove the memories of the past and allow you to start with a blank slate. However... But... Because our bosses are in the room, <laughs> Uh, we do want to point out that there is a problem with using that kind of cognitive restructuring, and we felt it was our duty to remind you of the Student Code of Conduct, which clearly states, <laughs> Hastings College prohibits possession, use, or distribution of controlled substances. And so, what are some other opportunities? One of the opportunities is positive visualization. Actually putting yourself into the situation at hand and visualizing success. But you need to visualize the details because as Capes and Oeddington 2011 state, if you go into that visualization and you start daydreaming, you're just gonna be wasting your energy and you're not going to achieve a better result from that fear. So you have to think about who is my audience that I am talking to. Visualize yourself speaking strongly, starting with a great attention getter and really getting your audience involved and watching as the audience is entertained and persuaded and informed by your message. So that positive visualization has to be very focused. Additionally, systematic desensitization can happen. This is the more you practice something, the easier it is. You know, hold that spider, see how it influences you, and hopefully you can start to breathe a little bit better. Practice your speeches multiple times or presentations for any of your classes. Get yourself into group settings. Start to practice, practice, practice. It desensitizes you. The example I have here is of Hillary Clinton. Clinton's fear was of the media and being criticized. And so she would always wear her hair in place, make up perfectly poised suits as she was running for president, as she was first lady. Then when she became secretary of state, she realized that, okay, with a little more practice, I can be better at my job and I don't have to put on this front. And so she was able to remove the makeup, let her hair down, put on her glasses and be who she wants to be and not worry about the media criticism. And as such, she has a very high approval rating. So systematic desensitization can definitely help. And the last is our skill building and training. This means that you need to utilize your resources. If you're afraid of group speeches, oh, go talk to an organizational instructor. If you're nervous about public speaking, even if it's not for a comm class, come talk to your comm instructors. The more that you can build your skills, the better you can become at embracing your fears. And then with that practice, you're gonna be able to show those skills that you have and utilize them in your everyday life. If McCroskey's work is accurate, if 95% of people in the United States have measurable, measurable fear in a speaking situation, what are the benefits in being at Hastings College, where an embedded part of the curriculum, particularly in the first year of experience, is helping you get past this fear? We have colleges and universities that we compete with every year to get students, but once they're on those institutions, what have they put in place to help their students? 
Um, there are a number of institutions in this state that do almost nothing with their curriculum to help you in this kind of situation. So if you walked in today slightly afraid and apprehensive, whether it's the orange tape, whether it's instructors taking attendance, you might have forgotten to take a piece of candy on the way in. Apprehension prevented you from taking advantage of these resources. There are two buckets in the back of the room. We do want you to take some or come up and get some from us before you leave. Um, there's one thing, though, that we would ask before you grab any candy and head outside. Uh, yes, please. please do not feed the squirrels. <laughs> My fear will thank you.